Welcome to Dropping Dimes, brought to you by Fast Break SA. Uh, we've got a pretty special guest on the show today, one of the guys that I enjoyed watching play for the Cape Town Tigers. He's a former Cape Town Tiger. He played for the South Sudan Cobras, so you know, he's got a little bit of experience in basketball. My man, Jared Harrington, um, he's gonna, he took the time, you know, he's all the way in Washington, D.C. He took the time to, you know, have a chat with us and see exactly what it is. Here's a part what is actually is going on in his life. Jared, how are you doing, my guy? Man, I'm doing a blast. I can't complain. How you doing, my brother? Nah, man, I'm doing good, man. Once again, thank you so, so much for making the time. Uh, it's been pretty hard to get you on the show, but we've been excited to get you on. We've been trying to get you on for a while, so we really do appreciate you fitting us into your your busy schedule. So for those of you guys who don't know, and Jared will obviously tell us a lot about it, but Jared is a, he's a former professional, he's a professional basketball player, right? But he's also, what he does behind the scenes, he's got him pretty active. My man is a businessman, is a philanthropist, he's an entrepreneur, he runs... He's involved in an investment company out in the States. So I'm quite interested to hear what that's about. Um, but I want to go right into it, right? It's, it's, it's a chance for all of us to get to know Jared Harrington. And I do know that a lot of the people that follow Fast Break SA obviously follow you by virtue of your time with the Cape Town Tigers. They follow you by virtue of your time in the BAL. So you got a lot of fans back home in South Africa. And I think that's a good chance for them to get to know you, man. So thank you so much for making the time, yeah? No, for sure. Thanks for having me, man. And shout out to everybody back in South Africa, for sure. 100%. So first things first, Jared, just to obviously just the brief background, get to know a little bit about you and, you know, where you're from, where you started playing the game, how you got into it. So first things first, where are you from, my guy, and how did you get into the game of basketball, and when did you start playing? Yeah, for sure. So I'm actually from Washington, D.C. Um, I've lived in Washington, D.C. and Maryland uh, for the majority of my life. I started playing a game around 6, 7. Uh, you know, you grew up outside playing around with your cousins, and your brothers and your friends. And um, I took a liking for it. Uh, my brother, actually, he played football. So I didn't want to really be in his shadow. So I was like, man, what's something I can do to kind of create my own lane? So basketball really stuck with me from a young age. That's pretty interesting, right? Because actually, I don't know if you watched our uh, Evans Gone Obama interview, one of the guys that also played for the Cape Town Tigers. His, his position around how, you know, his career path or his direction in life was centered around exactly whatever it is his brother was doing, right? He said that if his brother was a soccer player, he'd have played soccer. If his brother was a, a businessman, a lot like you, he'd have been a businessman. So what kind of made you want to deviate? Is your, your brother a little bit older than you, right? As far as I can imagine. Yeah, it, it's my actual, my oldest brother. And um, mm. I didn't want to really step in his shadow because my brother was actually good at, at football, right? He's, um, he's, he's fast forward years later, he's actually a coach of the Dallas, uh, Dallas Cowboys right now. So, you know, I already- He's the head coach of the Dallas Cowboys. Yeah, he's a quarterback coach for the Dallas Cowboys right now. <laughs> That's pretty interesting. Okay. Shout out to my brother, Evan Harrington. Shout out to my brother. But uh, like I said, I knew from an early age, like, he was going to do his thing in that, you know, he was getting a lot of publicity. Uh, a lot of people around the area already knew who he was. So I didn't want to be known as Evan Jr. I wanted to really create my own lane. So, you know, that's what took my life in the basketball. And I know you also got a, I think I guess it's one of your older brothers, but not the oldest. He also played ball, right? And I think that's the kind of direction you followed with him. I think he might have gone to a different college as far as what I read, but he also he also had a brother that played ball, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I had a lot of brothers, a lot of, a lot of cousins as well. So, you know, it, the sports has definitely run deep inside my family, but also, you know, where I'm from. And when, when did it happen for you where you kind of realized that, you know, and I, I know in America, right, it's either football like your brother or basketball more often than not. Obviously, there's baseball, there's ice hockey, but especially in the, in the African-American community, right, in the black communities where you guys are most adept to football and basketball. When did you know that, you know, what, this is exactly what you think you can do and when you realized that you can take us on to the next level? Uh, honestly, the way I was raised, I was raised with a lot of confidence from an early age, right? So... From the time I picked the game up, I was like, okay, I, I think I can be good. Even when I was, you know, riding a bench <laughs> in AAU ball, you know, 12, 13 years old, I still always had that belief that I could do it. And uh, I had a good circle around me that really pushed me. And, you know, even the times when they watched and came to the games when I wasn't even playing, they still supported me. So yeah. it gave me a lot of confidence to keep pushing. And it's also, I can imagine, right, having people come in and watch you win, <laughs> You know, you're kind of riding the bench, not getting those minutes. It kind of encourages you to kind of keep working and put yourself in a position where you are actually giving them to, something to come to as opposed to, you know, every day they come in and watch Jared and Jared just sitting down on the bench. I can imagine it also kind of lit you up a little bit, yeah? Oh, no question. No question. It definitely, uh, when you're sitting on the bench, it does something to your butt, I will say. So uh, you definitely want to get up and you want to get, yeah. you know, moving and shaking and, you know, ultimately getting that recognition as well. 
And, and when, when did it happen to you? When did you realize, nah, I got it. I can actually go on to the next level. You started at the age of six, right? You're playing with your brothers and your cousins, and obviously you played AAU ball. But when did you get up off the bench, you know, stop pulling them spinners out and actually start getting some game time? When did that happen for you? And when did you realize that you can take this on? This can be a thing for you. For sure. It, it was definitely, um, I would have to say, my eighth grade year. So my eighth grade year, I was going to public school all my life. And um, I had a slight growth spurt. I went from like maybe like five, six to maybe like five, nine. And uh, it was an upcoming school um, in the D.C. area called Princeton Day. And uh, at the time, they had um, some of the top ranked guys in the country. And um, I was like, man, I saw I went to one of the games, actually. And I was looking to transfer out of public school and actually go to my go to that school, you know, and start my high school year. So um, you know, I went up there. I worked out. The coach saw that I had the potential. And he ultimately, you know, offered me to come to the school. So once I made that jump from public school to private school, you know, that last grade in the middle school to ninth grade, I was like, okay, you know, I really got a potential to at least get a scholarship. Whether I make it pro, I'm not even thinking that far ahead right now. I'm just trying to get a scholarship to ultimately not have my parents pay for college. Okay. That's pretty interesting. And you mentioned college, right? And I know with 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 college basketball, there's a lot of divisions. There's division one, division two, division three. And the dream for every ball is to play in the highest level. And obviously, you started off in Division Three. Mm-hmm. Talk to me a little about your time in college. Right? I know you played for two different high, two different colleges, and I know you transferred to an HBCU. Talk to me a little about a little bit about your time at um, Albany State and that kind of adjustment when it was time to make a decision to move on to historically black college university. Yeah, for sure. So um, coming out of high school, I was getting recruited by a lot of Division Ones. Uh, fortunately, they. Um, I would say they didn't want to take the exact chance on me. I, w- I was one of those guys who almost was good enough for the Division One level at the time, but my body and my skills wasn't, you know, as developed. So a lot of people were recruiting me off of my potential. And so, um, you know, when it ca- when it came down to the amount of scholarships a lot of teams had, I obviously didn't make it right. And so I wanted to go somewhere where the coaches believed in me. And they actually believed in my talent in that time, you know. After and they give you a chance to play, right? They would actually give you some, some game time. If someone okay. believes in them, they would let you play. For sure. You, you definitely got to go where you're wanted, you know. And um, I felt like Daniel Webster, the D3 school, was a place. And the coaching staff were, came in. They treated me very well. And they actually were the first people to tell me, you know, you have a real chance, legitimate shot to make a professional career out of this thing. And so once they told me that, you know, me and my father and my mother, we have a close relationship as well. So I told them to play like they actually believe in me actually going pro. So, you know, that's the decision we decided to make. And a lot of the time, you kind of just need one person to say, look, no, I, I see you. There's something there. And especially if it comes from a head coach or the coaching staff, we deal with a bunch of players over the years. They see a bunch of talent. They tell a bunch of guys. But for them to actually single you out and say, you know what, Jared, looks like you got it. They must have done a lot for you. So, you mentioned uh, Division Three, uh, Daniel Webster, right? And then that was obviously before you transferred through to uh, Albany State. Mm-hmm. What were the contracts between the two before you transferred? How was your, what was your situation like at, at, at Webster? Where were you getting the game time that you needed? Were you getting the opportunities to play? Or did that improve as you moved on to, to the HBCU? So at uh, Daniel Webster, they put the ball in my hands from day one. So uh, I came in uh, the star, came in the starter, came in the captain from freshman to sophomore year. So I was very comfortable in that situation. I was playing well. Uh, my body really developed. Uh, at that point, I grew to like 6'3". You know, so I was really developing all angles. And the coaching staff was really tailoring uh, the, the totality of the team behind me for the most part. So, you know, when the school ended up having to force a shutdown because the school ended up having to, uh, you know, close, I was like, okay, cool. I have to go into a situation similar to this. And so out of all the schools that started recruiting me over, you know, mm-hmm. Albany State came in and um, they were like, yo, we we love what you did over there. We think you can do it plus more at this level. So we're just going to put the ball in your hands, you know, from day one. And so the campus was beautiful. Uh, he had two campuses. It's actually the biggest HBCU uh, student population in the state of Georgia and one of them in the country as well. So I wanted that big school feel because coming from a D3, it wasn't as large. So. It was it was definitely an opportunity for me, and you know they ultimately believe in the you know decision for me wanting to go pro as well. So a lot played into that factor. I see, I see. So 
Look, I went through your numbers and I checked your stats right as best as I could because I think you know with Division Three and HBCUs they aren't as 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 touted or the stats aren't as up to date as they might be for Duke University or the D1 schools, right? But it was quite interesting. As soon as you moved over to H, and I don't know if you know this, right? Because I know as a basketball player, when we're on the court, when we're doing our thing, all we know is to make the right plays, all we know is to take the buckets we get, and all we know is to make the stops, right? What was interesting is that your your game time increased over the years for obvious reasons, right? As you got more comp, you were there for three years. But as your game time increased, your, your your minutes, your your points per game kind of reduced. So in your first year, you were at 10, and then you kind of reduced slightly to about five or so per game. Was that because now you're getting more adept to creating opportunities for the rest of your guys, or was it just that there were other guys coming in? What, what do you think kind of created that kind of, you know, situation for you? Well, like like I said, again, you know, the unfortunate thing about D3 is that their ability to take statistics aren't always accurate. Uh, my first year, I did average around 11 and 12 as a freshman. Uh, the second year, I ended up averaging uh, 14.7. So my, my point production actually increased from freshman to sophomore year, but that was a result of me getting more comfortable. Uh, at that point, you know, they moved me from my natural position from shooting guard to point guard because they wanted to develop me more to a point guard. So it allowed my game to expand. And so, you know, it created a lot of opportunities with the ball just being in my hand naturally. So I had more opportunities to score as well at that uh, level. So uh, it, was, it was a great situation for me uh, in totality. Yeah, and you got to take them as they come, right? You kind of, if they put you in a certain position to play, you kind of got to do what you can to do what sure. you can to help the team. So I kind of understand that quite well. So on that point, right, they moved you between two guard and one guard. And obviously, you were a two guard your entire career, for lack of a better word, as you were coming up in AAU and in high school and in college. Where are you more comfortable now? Obviously, learning the the, the, the point guard skill obviously helps you a lot when it comes to a professional level because you need to be a little bit more versatile playing against bigger bodies. Where are you most comfortable? And if you if, if if it were up to you, where would you position yourself in court? I'm definitely more comfortable at the combo guard. Um, you know, I, over the years, of course, being a point guard has you know, been developed inside of me. So I'm always going to be able to play point. Uh, but me at my size now, I'm 6'5", 210. You know, so I like to be able to guard ones, twos, and threes, as well as, you know, play against one, twos, and threes. So, I'm a, I'm a little bit more versatile because of my size. So I love being at the combo guard, the wings, you know. But nowadays, especially in, in the time of my career, I want to win. <laughs> I always want to win. So I, I take a lot, you know, out of myself and put it more into my team. So I just want to definitely, definitely, you know, help my team win at all costs. Sure, sure. I got you. I got you. So just one last thing on this HBCU thing. I think it's quite interesting, right, because there's not a lot of guys that go and play – that, that would choose to go through the HBCU route simply because it's not as talented as the big as, as most television games aren't on, you know, aren't gonna be on the, the HBCU side or they're not gonna broadcast as many of those. So it, mu it must have been an interesting dynamic to kind of obviously wanna play pro. I can imagine that from a young age, it's it's what we all want to do, right? Playing basketball wanna go to especially in the States. You guys know that it, unlike here back home, you guys know that in the States, if you're put in the right position, if you're put in the right schools, if you're put in the right kind of a line of sight for the right kind of people. You might just get a better chance than someone at a smaller college or someone in a Division three college somewhere that nobody has heard of. So that couldn't have been an easy choice, right? Because you wanted to be a, a, a basketball player. You wanted to play pro. Do you think going to an HBCU kind of hurts the chance of aspiring models like yourself? Or is it now becoming more and more of a legitimate outlet to get into the NBA? I think that's a two-part answer. I think first, it's definitely changing as the years go on. Uh, the exposure that these kids are able to get from any level, whether it's HBCU, NIA, D1, D2, D3, it doesn't really matter. If you can play, you know, especially with social media, they're going to find you. Social media. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go yeah, ahead. They're going to definitely find you, no questions about it. So, I mean, I wouldn't say it necessarily hurts, but I can also see, you know, the other side of things where, you know, you might take a kid from Duke and a kid from Duke might not even play a lot. He might average, you know, three points a game. And then you take an HBCU kid, he might average 20 points a game. And then just because of, you know, where they come from and the connection that they may able you know, to, to get, they might be at a, you know, a disadvantage, unfortunately. So, you know, it, it, it's one of those situations you have to be very, very delicate, but also, you know, know your worth. And I tell people all the time, you know, go where you're wanted because that is nothing better than going to a place where, you know, you can, you can achieve success.
Yeah. And I think you mentioned that in an interview I watched of yours where you said that, you know, your decision between Cape Town Tigers, Mongolia, and the, the kind of professional decisions you made are always based on going where it is you want it versus chasing the money or chasing the minutes. It's got to be where you know the situation works out. So I want to touch a little bit on your professional career before we get into that. So you started playing in Mongolia in 2020, right? And then that unfortunately got cut short because that's when the pandemic hit and obviously, you know, a lot of uncertainty around what's going to happen next or if you didn't get a chance to play. And I think at that stage, you decided to go back home. So, and that, from there, you moved on to the Cape Town Tigers here in South Africa. Wouldn't, that, wouldn't it have been an easier, you know, route to just go back to Mongolia where they had recruited, where were the first person to give you a chance or the first people to give you a goal? Um, Probably just would have been easier to go back there. Right? What, what, what influenced your decision to go from Mongolia to Cape Town, South Africa? So, for me, coming out of college, uh, I had a very successful year and I actually declared for the draft. Um, I didn't get drafted to the NBA, so it was either go to the G League uh, or try to take the G League route or go to Asia because that was, you know, like you said before, those were the first people that reached out to me to give me that chance. And so, uh, you know, after the whole thing happened with COVID, I was back home training. Actually, I was in Miami training. And uh, a good friend of mine, Larry Morsley, uh, he told me about uh, what was happening in the NBA Africa and in the ball. And for me, it was a no-brainer because I've always had interest in Africa, you know, on the business side of things because I was still doing business back then. And a lot of my friends that I grew up with, you know, are in Africa. So, you know, me getting back in touch with my roots, I definitely loved the opportunity to go play and live out my dream in, in South Africa. Like, that was a no-brainer. So it was, uh, like I said, for me, it was a best fit for me, you know, better than to go back to Asia. And, you know, side note, Asia's very cold. <laughs> so <laughs> nobody like the cold, I, at least not me. Yeah. I get that. I get that. I get that. So Cape Town Tigers, man, you, you, you decided to come out to Cape Town Tigers. Obviously, speaking for myself, speaking for a lot of the South African fans and the Cape Town Tigers fans, we appreciate it, right? We appreciate having a, a player that's good enough to either go to the G League or even declare for the draft. And by the way, that, that's big That's big time for, for, for us in the South African context because obviously you guys start playing ball a lot, uh, a lot earlier in your lives, sure, but... Like you said, with Duke versus HBCU versus with the States versus a South African basketball player, you just got you guys just have your eyes on on your whole lot. So it's pretty great for us to have a player that could be drafted into the NBA come out and play for a team representing South Africa. So talk to you about your time with the Tigers, man. You you were a starting two guard at the time. You know you you were doing quite well for yourself, and I think you were with the Cape Town Tigers in their first year trying to compete for the championship or trying to get into the BL. So what was the experience like compared to? All other leagues you might have played. Let's say Mongolia, the only other professional league you played. Yeah, uh, my, my time in Cape Town was awesome. Uh, I, I have people in Cape Town who I consider my family. And uh, like I said, that's my second home regardless. So it's, it's, it's a good feeling that I was able to come in there and help Cape Town Tigers, you know, qualify for the ball. Uh, we, we, we did a lot of things for the community early and brought a lot of excitement and life back into South African basketball, I would say. And uh, it was really an honor. Uh, for me, everybody received me so well, and um, it just made me feel so good, man. You know, so I, I shout out to all my people in not just Cape Town, but the totality of South Africa. And, um, I just can't wait to come back and see you guys. Yeah, and, and I think you mentioned that quite a bit. Right? I know you and obviously the Cape Town Tigers owner, or part owner being American, so I'm not, I'm not too clued up on his entire story or his profile. But I know that he, from what I've seen from the outside looking, he's had a keen interest in the infrastructure in Cape Town and just, you know, outside of the basketball, also uplifting the communities. He went as far as getting um, a female basketball team also with the, with the Tigers that's taken other organizations in our country years and years to get right. I think he did it in the second or third year. Mm -hmm. So... Your, your your work before you started playing, you mentioned a little bit about how you had things you were working on outside of basketball. Yeah. Specifically to the, and look, we're going to get into that, right? I know you've got a whole lot of things you're doing that I really want to speak about at the, as, as, you know, the last topic. But just while you touched on that, what were you doing in the background or behind the scenes outside of basketball when you got to South Africa? Uh, outside of South Africa, I had a lot of initiatives with my company that I founded a few years back called Beat the Arts. And um, like I said, we're all about the economic development of not just, you know, America or Africa, but entire mankind. So there was a lot of initiatives in South Africa, especially, you know, one that we really made an impact with was a lot of people were getting, you know, evicted from their homes um, and not just their homes, per se, houses, but their homes as in their tents. 
and places on the side of the street where, you know, these people live. And so they didn't really have a lot of water or a lot of shelter. And uh, one thing we came in, we provided that and uh, we actually taught uh, a lot of financial literacy and we actually, you know, had conversations to try to create self-sustainability within, you know, Cape Town and within South Africa as well. So that was one of the things we did. We did a lot of, um, you know, food drives. We did a lot of uh, runs to bring the community together. Uh, the list goes on and on. So, uh, like I said, we're working on so many projects in South Africa now. I'm sure we're going to touch on it later, but my time in South Africa is definitely a uh, life changer. So on that note, just for you guys watching uh, out there at home, BTO Investments, that's that's what um, I'm Jared Harrington is working on. That's his company started a few years ago. Go out and give it a follow. It'll show you a lot, of, a, a lot about what you need to know as far as investments and just, you know, beating the odds, man, like you said. But we definitely want to go into that into proper detail at the end. But I want to... I want to talk about Jared's heartbreak for South African fans when he decided to kind of, you know, go over to South Sudan and leave us behind, man. That was a, it was a bit of a tough one, right? Because, you know, when, you, when you're watching the Cape Town Tigers, they're the only, they're, they're the best organization in sports, in, in basketball, in our game that we've seen in a very, very, very long time. It was monopolized by one team where they would win everything with the best players in the country. And the Cape Town Tigers brought you guys and you guys were obviously able to qualify every single year since you've been um, formed. What, what, what influenced that decision with South Sudan? And obviously, I think it was, they were, I've read a couple of articles, but I'd like to hear from you. What, what influenced the decision to move on after one season with the Tigers over to South Sudan? Yeah, for sure. Uh, like I said, it was all love from Cape Town and Cape Town's Tigers, but a situation happened and we didn't know if we were going to actually qualify for the ball or not, mm -hmm. right? So everybody was on standstill. And so in the professional sports world, it's like we, as professional athletes, we can't really, we can't be on standstill, especially when we have a goal we're trying to accomplish. And so, you're not getting any younger either, right? You, you yeah, get all that. Yeah. For sure. And my goal, you know, is the ball. It's always going to be the ball. Um, and so every year I plan on playing the ball. I might play for a team here. I might play for a team there. But I want everybody to understand, you know, at the end of the day, it's always – uh, a career decision for every athlete. And so, you know, with a situation like that, it was kind of even out of my control and I had to make the best decision for me. And uh, K-Town understood that. And we still, to this day, uh, we have a great relationship. Even when we were uh, at the ball, we were all in the bubble. You know, we yeah. sit on lunch and just have great times, you know. So it's always love for them. But And also shout out to South Sudan for the opportunity. Not for real, man. For real. And I, I think, I don't know if you know this, but I'm sure as a player, we kind of feel this thing. But... Your, your time with the Cape Town Tigers, you, you got more minutes in South Sudan than you did in, uh, with the Tigers. That's right, Jim? Yeah, for sure. But at the same time, same thing that happened with you at, at uh, Albany State where mm -hmm. your minutes almost went up by about 10 or so, but your, your production reduced, all the production on paper, right? Because I know there's a lot of intangibles on a basketball court. There's a lot of things that we might do. And if you want to play 26 minutes for a team that is as good as, as, as South Sudan's Cobras, you, 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 you're doing something on that floor, right? As much as it might show up on the stat sheet or not. So what, what do you think put you in that position to play more but average less. And you know, as basketball, as a basketball fan enthusiast, you want to see someone score. If they're not scoring, if you don't know the game well enough, you feel like they're not contributing. So what do you think influenced your increase in game time but reduction in productive in, in yeah production, I guess? Yeah, I mean for, for South Sudan in particularly, um, we were a team that was very young. And um, I was started I was the captain of the team, right? Little, I mean everybody oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah, I was the captain of the team. So I was like, me being a captain, that comes with a lot of leadership and it comes with a lot of sacrifice as well. And um, I was had a one goal and one goal only, and that was to make it to Rwanda. And then after Rwanda, that goal is completed, we make it to the championship. And then, you know, after that goal is completed, we win the championship. So that was my trajectory at the end of the day. So, you know, anything, anything I had to do at the end of the day, if that was, you know, me moving over to point guard again, because that's another thing with the Cape Town Tigers, I always played uh, the two. So I was able to just score, you know, I had great point guards, I had great people around me as well, and that were able to, uh, you know, let me do my thing in terms of scoring purposes. But in South Sudan, I was playing straight point guard, right? And then um, towards the end of, end of the uh, our, our season, you know, I try to you know, go back to combo a little bit, but at that time we already had a rhythm of me being at the one. So at the end of the day, it took a lot of sacrifice for me and, um, you know, learning the guys and trying to make everybody happy so we can be successful. And it'd be like that sometimes, man. If you really want to see your team succeed, if you really want to see your team win, sometimes you got to take away, you know, what, what you know you can do just to give someone else a chance. On that though, right, I think 
the BAL is a, is a legitimate avenue, you know. I think it's it's undeniable. One of your former teammates, actually, I think his name is Mayan Kerr. Sorry if I butcher his name. Yeah. He's now he's he's made his way into the G League from the BAL, and I think he got drafted by the Westchester Knicks. So it's actually a legitimate avenue for for, for guys to actually try and make it through to the BNL. Evans got up on as well. He got invited to the, the Milwaukee Bucks training camp. What, what word do you have for American ballers that are looking at the BAL? Look, and oh, look, I get it, right? There's a little bit of a stigma around Africa and and you know who or what we are. Those, especially if you aren't really clued up on what's going on here. So, what would you say to ballers that side who, like you, could go to the G League where they could either get paid because a lot of the G League is starting to affiliate and start to you know take care of dudes like that, or they could go out and play in China or Europe. Or there's a league here that is actually accredited by the by the NBA. Well, where would you recommend dudes go? Obviously, they haven't played in China as well. Uh, I would definitely say the BAL is an up-and-coming route. Um, I tell people that all the time. The NBA has done a great job with the league. Uh, we have great commissioners. Uh, you know, the, the teams are going to keep developing, right? Right now we're at 12, but it's 55 countries in Africa. So it's like it, it's going to keep developing. And it's one of those leagues that if you look up 10 years from now, it's going to be in a total different trajectory in terms of, you know, fan base and, you know, the awareness of the league. So, you know, I'm just blessed to be a part of it early, but I'm also blessed to share that knowledge to the young up and coming kids. We're like, okay, yeah, like you said before, you can go to Europe, you know, where it's cold and, you know, long seasons and you have a lot of different things that come with Europe and China as well, or you can fight that G League grind, or you can just try to, you know, create your own path by trying the BAL as well, if you get that opportunity. Okay, okay. So a couple of tough ones for you just because you know I like to have fun with the guys I get on the show. <laughs> Who are you rooting for in the BAL, okay? I know you played for two of those teams and you're unnecessarily affiliated to them directly right now, but yeah. Who are you rooting for in the BL as much as you've been following? We've got we got South Sudan, we've got the Tigers and a bunch of other teams. So you got you got your eye on anybody? If you talk are you talking about the road to BAL or are you talking about the actual BAL? No, 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 the actual BAL. I'm confident the Tigers will make it. I'm quite the confident. Yeah, I'm confident the Tigers will be there Oh yeah, for for the actual beer, yeah, I'm rooting for whatever team I'm on. So, you, <laughs> or you trying to get back? Are you on uh, yeah. that note? Are you trying to play ball again? Are you trying to get back? To, you mentioned oh, it a little bit earlier that you want to get back into the basketball Africa League. That's your focus. And what I saw as well is that for a lot of guys who don't know, you've been working out with Alex McLean, right? The head the head trainer for the Washington Wizards. Mm -hmm. I saw that as recently as a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago. Is that with the intention to find your way back into the BL? Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely planning on playing in the BAL uh, for a very long time. Um, people forget, you know, I've had so much experience in the BAL already. People only forget I'm only 25. So I was like, I still have... Well, you're one of the most experienced players the league has seen, right? You've only been around for a couple of years and you played two full seasons. You could be one of them. It could be a vet at this stage, right? You know, so it's like, that's always going to be my goal. And uh, whatever team that I decide to play on, like I said, I always want to be known as a guy that wants to go out there and win and um, has that experience of playing in the ball for multiple teams, you know. So, you know, just stay tuned. <laughs> yeah. So, so Jared, you, you, look, you, you've spoken a lot about your basketball, and I, I know that with, with athletes, right, we tend to gravitate towards what we're good at, what we're naturally talented at. You mentioned you had a growth spurt that kind of worked in your favor, and a lot of you, obviously, you put in a ton of hard work. I've seen your training. I've seen you grind for even before you made it to the Tigers. That's a natural talent that you have, and anybody would dispute that. But it seems as though your passion is more on the business end, the philanthropy, and you know the entrepreneurship. So I want to touch a little bit on that. I think that's quite important, especially as as an athlete. Right? People see you on screen and they believe that. That's, especially if you, if you call yourself or if you're called a professional, they feel as though that's your only source of income, your only interest, the only thing you're doing. Talk to you about your, your and I want to let you go on about this as much as you possibly can, because I do believe that from what I've seen, it's what you're most passionate about. Talk to me about what you're doing outside of basketball. We're back in Washington, D.C., and how these things translate back to Africa. Talk to me about BTO investments. Let me hear what it is you're doing outside and how the hell are you able to juggle all of these things while still being, while still being scouted by, 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 by teams in the BL? I can answer that quick one. Um, I'm able to manage all of those things by having a great team. I've been doing it for three years now. So, like I said, it hasn't limited uh, my success on the court. It's actually – helped it because it expanded my mind so much. But uh, like I said, I have a company called Beat the Odds, um, and I also have a nonprofit called Beat the Odds Global. And um, what we do, we, we focus on economic development of our entire diaspora, but, in, you know, especially everybody in mankind. You know, we, we focus on uh, different forms of literacy because at the end of the day, we are a literacy conglomerate. 
So whether that's financial literacy, private equity, VC, agriculture, energy, um, business monetization, business one-on-one, uh, we have a lot of different subsets that we you know, teach all levels. Uh, we have different tiers with it. So we have a tier one, a tier two. Uh, we're backed by a certified curriculum. Um, and so we're doing a lot of things uh, in Africa. It actually you know, expanded while I was in Africa two years ago. And it's uh, actually, you know, start starting to, <clears throat> excuse me, starting to rise back on the America side. So, uh, like I said, we're, we're doing amazing things. And so I actually jumped into the infrastructure part of Africa. I have 12 different projects uh, that I'm working on. I collabed uh, with a lot of great people, uh, with a water project, an energy project. Uh, I'm looking forward to building an innovation slash sports academy school uh, in South Africa. Uh, and so we're trying to do a lot of things on infrastructure state in, in terms of building these different stadiums um, and incorporating these different water projects, energy projects, all within a big ecosystem. So Africans and you know people all over the world can have self-sustainability. Uh, and, and as far, you mentioned, obviously, the one that's going to catch my eye first is you're, you're, you're looking into developing the infrastructure in a, in, on the sports side of South Africa. So you mentioned that you've got a great team, you've got a bunch of great partners. And I can only imagine that your, your ties to the BAL or your, 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 your having played in the league also gives you some kind of, you know, connection to the right kind of influence and those kinds of things. So do you have any partners that are back this side that are currently pushing that project for you? Or is it all just you and the team you have out in the States in Washington? I have a team uh, back. Um, it's actually some of them are in the DRC. Uh, some of them are in Nigeria. Uh, some of them are in Cape Town. Uh, so it's a, it's a total, totality people uh, on this effort because, like I said, we have different phases with these different projects. And so it's great, you know, we have platforms like yourself to push this awareness because at the end of the day, I feel, especially for the rebranding of Africa, because that's really what needs to happen first, right? We have to go into, especially people outside of Africa, so in Asia, Europe, America, a lot of people have to change their way of thinking when they think about Africa, right? We got to talk about Africa different. We have to rebrand that. And that starts with, you know, the infrastructure piece, right? So when we go in inside of these places in Africa, right, we have to have nice facilities, right? We have all these different people coming from the continent, you know, making an impact on the sports world or on the philanthropy or entrepreneurship world, but they don't have top notch facilities to practice in. And that to me just doesn't make sense when, you know, a majority of the, you know, the talent is coming from one place. So it, it's great that you know, I'm a part of this efforts uh, at such an early standpoint. And I feel like, you know, after we're talking about Africa specifically, I just know um, the untapped potential it is here. So I'm just happy to be a front runner. I was watching a video of yours where you said that where they, where they, where one of the interviewers asked you that do you think that it's Africa's time now? And you said it was Africa's time five years ago, which is pretty interesting, right? I think five years ago you were what, 19, 18 years old, 18 years old, and you already had the eye for moving in this direction. What inspired you to kind of go into philanthropy at, at a young age? You know, it takes to, to start a nonprofit, in, in my opinion, in my an educated opinion on that. You, you need a little bit of money, right? You need a little bit of financial support from somewhere. And more often than not, you see it in the NBA, for instance, these guys start their foundations or their, their organizations once they've got a little bit of a check behind them that made some money. Whereas with you, it sounds that you were looking down this route even before you could even smell a dime as far as a professional career. So what inspired you to hit in this direction? I mean, my environment uh, inspired me first. I mean, I have family members. I have friends who... Ultimately, you know, when it comes back to literacy, whether it's financial literacy, whether it's different forms of literacy, it comes back to literacy and education. So at the time, you know, even with me being 18, I felt like I was always an out of the box thinker. And I'm like, OK, I don't need money to make a change. You know, all I need is for me to keep pushing and use my confidence and my platform for good. And so, uh, like I said, I grew up with a lot of people from Nigeria, a lot of people from other parts of Africa. And those were my close friends. And they always inspired me to get back home, right? They always inspired me to get back in touch. But what was ultimately, I never knew. You know, being a, a young Black American, I mean, you don't know these things, right? You know, it's, it's unfortunate, but it's just the reality of things. So, you know, I always had a mindset that was a little bit different. And so I was never scared to step out there. I was never scared to really voice my opinion. Or I was never scared to articulate myself in a way where, you know, like they say nowadays, I'm you're more than an athlete, you know? So it was very yeah. 
good for me. Hundred percent, man. And look, you actually spoke a little bit about your the the, the desire to sort of educate and give some, some even any kind of literacy, right? Not necessarily financially, but there was one thing that stuck out to me, and I think you did a, a press at Howard University very recently, where you said to the guys that you spoke, you said it, it's not spoken about enough. But in the black community, we're tricked to think a certain way, right? We're tricked to as soon as you get a check, you want to put your money here. Or as soon as you get a little bit of money, you want to rush it straight to the bank. Or And that was pretty interesting to me because I, I am a little bit into investments as well. And I think I, I didn't find it as early as you did it early in my life. I think for me, it happened actually when I had a little bit of money and could start playing around. But mm -hmm. That kind of thinking doesn't just happen, right? I can imagine it was a level of influence from home or those kinds of things. But you seem to be most passionate about the financial side of it from the research I've done. And sure. that's more based on not necessarily your own financial um upliftment but the guy the people around you the communities around you or the african-american community yeah yeah for sure i mean financial literacy is very very important to me and um you know bto investments was started based off of financial literacy and we just expanded over the years but for me it hit home because i have a lot of friends that plays in the nfl a lot of friends that played in the nba uh, a lot of play, friends that play overseas and uh or a lot of rappers and entertainers at the end of the day too. And those are my homeboys and homegirls. And so, you know, I will see all the time, you know, they get their money or I hear these stories that they get their money and they have their financial advisors stealing from them or they, they might have someone that they trust and they put in that position to, you know, just take from them. And so it was really, you know, it was heartbreaking for me. And I ultimately didn't want to be in that situation because, you know, most black people in general, we haven't handled a certain amount of money. We haven't handled Two hundred thousand dollars before, right, or three hundred thousand dollars before, and maybe mm -hmm. our parents might not have done it either. So, I was able to step out the box and just try to educate myself first, and go really, really hard, and then use my platform and reach out to those networks and those people that had them gems, and take it back to my community at the end of the day. And then it started to make me more smarter as time went on, and then I seen others around me, their passions and you know their influence changed as well. So. When I was creating something great and um, it just really inspired me more. So I just pushed harder and then fast forward. Now we are, we are. So obviously, like I mentioned a little bit earlier, and like you're saying now, you have a lot of friends in the NFL, you have a lot of friends in entertainment, a lot of friends playing at a high level, both domestically and internationally. Mm -hmm. And without putting on the spot or going too far off script, right? So no need to feel the need to kind of go into things that you're uncomfortable going into. But what, what kind of support do you think that you've been getting from NBA Africa as far as building a, a sports facility, for instance, in South Africa? Are you getting the right kind of support you need from organizations or governing bodies that have that influence? Or are you really just here? And obviously, naturally, looking at how you've been doing it so far, whether you get the help you need or not, you're going to go ahead. But naturally, you know, everybody needs somebody. It's just easy to get a certain way when you have collaboration and support. So do you believe you're getting the support you would like to be getting? Or do you think that there's more these other organizations can do to jump in? Because naturally, a nonprofit is tough to back, but also, if you're in the space, it's kind of the direction you'd like to head in. So do you, do, uh, do you have the kind of support you'd like from all these other organizations without going into names or details? Mm -hmm. And what would you say to them if they're watching right now? Uh, the first thing, I think a lot of times, we, as people, we have to you know work together, like you said, and we have to collab, like you said, but also we have to understand where everybody is in life. And so I'm at a point now where before I go to the people I know that will eventually help me, I want to make sure everything is in place. We already passed a certain phase. And then I would like to bring in those type of partners. Uh, for all the people that are watching that's interested in, you know, we have, you know, all the necessary information that we are looking to forward over to those people to join our initiative. Because at the end of the day, it's so much more than just me, right? It's so much more than beat the odds, you know, it's so much more than nonprofit. It's about creating self-sustainability in Africa, period. That's all it's about. So, you know, it's a no-brainer that, you know, when I do come to these uh, people, you know, they will get behind it because, uh, like I said, it's, it's going to help us all. Now, I mean, I, I, from the outside looking at, I can definitely commend you, right, for understanding that it would be great to get support, but also understanding that sometimes the support isn't where they need you to be outside of them not giving you what you You want to position yourself correctly to, you know, get to where it is you want to be. And if you want to get noticed, do the work and the work will happen. That's pretty, that's, that's, that's pretty solid. Enough. So for those of you guys watching at home, BTO Investments, please give them a follow on Twitter. That's where I found them. They want to give you all the advice you need as far as their opinions on what investments look like, their opinions on 
what money is. They won't tell you what to do with your money, but they will just paint scenarios and give you ideas and just make you think a little bit more. I can tell you for sure that when I started following, and the world was getting a whole lot smaller, like we said a little bit earlier, right? social media and all these kinds of things, the world was a lot smaller than it was five years ago. You can really learn a lot about changing your entire life if you follow the right accounts on Twitter. So really give them a shout, give them some love, and I promise you, you'll, you'll, you'll learn a couple of things. So Jack, you got a lot, man. Like I said, you have a lot going on. You mentioned that you got 12 projects that you're working on. You want to do some infrastructure out in SA. And at the same time, you're working out with professional head trainers from the NBA. What comes next for you, man? What, what, what do you plan to, what, what is your biggest focus? Like you said, you have your talent and then you also have your passion. What so, is it that comes with your inheritance? So for me, um, I've definitely been focusing on a lot of balance in my life, right? Like I said, I have all these different things. I have basketball and I've been able to create uh, sort of, a, sort of a, a support method between me and my team where I don't really have to worry about a lot of different things uh, where I don't need to be spread out too thin, right? So my focus always remains on basketball, but my focus also, you know, remains on business at the same time. So uh, I'm have the ability to do that, and I'm grateful to God for that ability, right? Uh, but what comes next for me, I'm just training for the ball season. Um, I have a event coming up in Washington, D.C. A lot of uh, people are flying in uh, for this event. It's called Innovation Now 2022. I'm bringing it to South Africa uh, probably in 2025 uh, or 2024, rather, my mistake. And then um, 2023, in South Africa, I'm throwing the World Youth Leader Summit uh, somewhere, hopefully in Cape Town. If, that, if all goes well on the logistics side, uh, it will either be in Cape Town or in Johannesburg. Uh, so we're excited about that. Um, like I said, we, we're in a phase one of um, our infrastructure, Beach Spoke Stadiums, as well as uh, our innovation slash sports academy that we're, we're building. And so, uh, like I said, we're doing a lot of great things, man. And um, like I said, uh, my body's in, in great shape. My mental health is in great shape. And so uh, I'm just prepared to go to the ball and help whatever team I decide to play for, you know, win the championship. And then right over that, you know, just keep building. Yo, you know, since we got you on the show, well, you know what Fast Break's about, and we like to break news when we can. Have you had any offers from the BL, my guy? Are teams talking to you? Are you looking at a way to go? Or is it still just, you know, it's out of season right now, you're taking it easy? Well, what's going on on that front? I mean, I, I got to keep that between, I got to keep that between me and my agent uh, right now. I have to give, uh, I have is, to give it a try. <laughs> but, but just for fast break, it is some some talks going around right now uh, that we're very excited about. Like I said, road the ball is coming up. You know, you never know. Stay tuned. Uh, and then the ball season is coming up as well. So, like I said, that's just something, you know, you just got to follow me on Jerry Harrington 10 on Instagram. Also, BTO yeah. Investments on Instagram as well. So. Look, man, speaking, speaking for myself, we haven't been a two guard, and I really did appreciate your game, right? You played with a lot of my peers, a lot of guys I used to play, I, I used to play with when I played. And it was really good to watch them being able to hold their own next to an American basketball player that obviously, like I said, you, you, you could have been in the G League and you might have even been, you had your name in the draft. So you, you're quite big time. So it was quite encouraging, I know, for my mates, for the guys coming up to see us be able to start a game with a guy that played at your level, with a guy that has your skills. So I'm quite excited to hear to see what comes next for you. I would love for you to be back in the BAL. And I mean, ultimately, I'd love for you to make it to the top. And I'd love to see you in the NBNC make a, a proper, 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 proper um, influence on a good team there. So all the best as far as that's concerned, man. I hope it really works out the way you want it. But one thing I really do appreciate the most, Jared, is your work outside of the game, man. It's, 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 so you might not know this, right? But in South Africa, if you're playing at a professional level outside of the Cape Town Tigers, of course, and now domestically, you still, have, you still need to have a nine to five. Whereas with you, you don't need to have that, right? You're doing quite well for yourself. Things are, you're getting some country, you're getting chances to play in professional leagues. And you're still trying to help people and you're still trying to uplift communities, even without any financial help. Or even if the financial help comes along, you're trying to do what it is you can to change the world and change life. So I definitely commend you on that, man. And big ups, keep going. Keep doing what it is you need to do. And I hope it all works out for you the way you need to, man. Man, I appreciate you for having me, man. Let me share a little bit what I'm doing on the court and off it, man. I appreciate you. And shout out to everybody yeah. back in SA. I can't wait to see y'all next year. Hey, man, it better be in a Tigers uniform. So, 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 Jared, before I let you go, man, before I let you go, there's a couple of quick fire questions, rapid fire questions where I'd like to get to know. And these, these questions let me know if I need to know about a basketball player, by the way. So if you give me one or two, the producer wouldn't let me do it in the beginning of the show because I might have just mess with the mood a little bit. So I'm going to ask you a few quick fire questions and hear what it is you're about. No need to think about it. No need to, you know, go too deep into it. Just answer whatever comes to you. Yeah? Um, MJ or Braun, who's your goat and why? 
Bron because I ain't grew up watching MJ. I only grew up watching. You're my guy. I knew. I knew you're my guy. I could just tell you're my guy. You're my guy. Go ahead. Sorry. Why? Why, bro? I mean, I, I like he's just more versatile to me. Uh, he's bigger. He could do everything MJ can do. But at the same time, I do see what people are saying about MJ's mentality. Um, like I said, I didn't grow up watching MJ, right? But I grew up watching Bron, so I can only go with what I see. Hey man, I knew you were not get along. I kind of just knew. Um, who's your favorite NBA team, and who's your favorite player of all time? My favorite NBA team right now is the Wizards. Uh, of course, I'm from DC, right? So I mean, they're my favorite. Uh, my favorite NBA player, you said? Yeah, all time. Gotta be, gotta be Kobe. I mean, I grew up watching Kobe. Uh, like I said, I, the whole Mamba mentality, and I love what he's doing all, outside of the court as well, towards the end of his career. So that was inspiring to me too. So. I mean, I'm a big Kobe fan, too full. You actually kind of fall, fall a little bit into Kobe's foot without sidetracking too much. You kind of fall in Kobe's footsteps where he did a lot of the work behind the scenes very quietly. He had that, that project where he would make a wish foundation. He would grant every single wish he could outside of playing time. And he would always deny camera X or refuse any kind of media attention. And that's kind of a little bit of the direction you're kind of heading in. So I can kind of, I can see the similarities. And obviously him having been a two guard, him having been a two guard in an area you got to watch. He, one of my buddies, one of the panelists on the show has said to me before that Kobe Bryant is the greatest shooting guard to have played in the toughest era of shooting guards, which is also kind of a real thing, right? He played against Ray Allen at his peak, Tracy McGrady, he played against MJ, Reggie Miller. So, Kobe, Kobe, you, you and I could be friends, but I like what you're telling me. I don't know about the Washington sure. Wizards, so but that's your home time. Who you got for season MVP, bro, this year? Season MVP. I know it's early, right? It's very premature. But who you got? Um, I wouldn't be surprised if I seen Ja. Uh, I like what Ja's doing. Um, but at the same time, I, I do don't want to sleep on Damian Lillard because I feel like Damian Lillard has a lot to, to show and to prove with his injury last season. So, I mean, those are my two guys I have on my watch list. I'm biased. I like the guards. Yeah, and Damian Lillard started out quite hot, right? He, he, he's been putting up some serious numbers now. He's in top five MVP conversation as we speak outside of this Lillard injury. And he also kind of drop my leg because with a bit of a dagger but you know these things that happen but I, I like that I, I can get behind the Giannis and the game in so Jared bro when it's all said and done right you play basketball at a high level you are working behind the scenes in multiple facets trying to change continents essentially trying to change countries continents and infrastructure when it's all said and done when you've played when you've done the work you're 60 65 years old looking back at your life how would you want to be remembered how would Jared Harrington want to be remembered for what has they've done I definitely want to be remembered as a world leader in some shape or form, um, whether it's on the poli – I don't necessarily have to be on the politician uh, side of things to be a world leader. I just want to be known as a world leader based off my impact, uh, whether that's, you know, on all these different continents that I'm going to affect. Uh, I just want to be known as that and a good person at the end of the day. You know, there's too many people walking around here with bad energy, man. I got, I got to be known as a, a good guy, man, at the end of the day. So, you know, that's, that's all. If God can give me those two things, I think I had a good life. And man, look, from the outside looking in, I think you're doing a good job at both of these so far. Both of those things so far, you're doing a pretty good job. Um, Jared, my man, thank you so, so much for your time. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. For you guys watching at home, please follow my man, Jared Harrington. It's at Jared, Jared Harrington 10 for his personal accounts. And I think we have BTO, we have it down there. We have BTO Investments, where you get to learn about what it is he does outside of basketball, what he does behind the scenes. Jared, Look, man, you mentioned a lot about what you've got going on, what you want to do. We as Fathwick appreciate your time. We appreciate your contribution to both the game of basketball and the community as a whole, right, outside of basketball. And if we can do anything to help, if you, you know, would like to be, we'd obviously like to have you back on the show, but if there's anything we can do, I think we have a pretty good dialogue here. And as, as, as Fathwick, I'm sure I speak for Fathwick, you can say that we, you, you got our support, we're behind you, and we hope you can be there on the journey to help you through it, man. But thank you so, so much for making the time. We appreciate it, huh? Appreciate you for having me, brother. All right, man. Have yourself a good one. Take care, but we'll have you on soon, yeah? Yes, sir. Take care. Thank you so much for watching. Cheers, man.